It's Debbie Potts, and I'm back with a new season of my rabbit holes. What am I digging into this week? Muscle health, metabolic health, muscle metabolism, muscle protein synthesis. I want to know why and how and to share this information with you. So let's dive in. Welcome to the The Low Carb Carb Athlete Athlete Podcast, Podcast. where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey guys, it's Debbie, and I just wanted to give you a quick little message from one of our sponsors, LMNT, Element. It's spelled L-M-N-T, but pronounced Element. If you haven't heard about this, Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means there's a lot of salt with no sugar, and it's formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited for those doing a keto, low-carb, or paleo diet. And I think this is great for athletes, especially in the summertime and when you're training in warmer climates. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. None of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers. That's it. I like the unsweetened one because the other flavors do have a little stevia, but stevia doesn't do well in my body. So I prefer the unsweetened element And I like the packets because I can throw them in my bike bag when I go on a long bike ride or when traveling. And I can just dump a packet in my water and it keeps me so much more hydrated. Because remember, we don't sweat out water, we sweat out minerals. So check it out. You've got a nice little gift from them if you use our discount code, drink element. I'll put the link in the show notes. But using the code low carb athlete. You get a free gift with purchase. You get a free element sample pack with any order when you order with low carb athlete on our special URL code. So support the podcast, support element. It's backed by science and we love what they're doing. So try it out. Okay, guys, what is metabolic health? Is it really focusing on muscle health and how do we improve muscle health? How can we maybe focus on improving our metabolism by stimulating our muscle and how does that work? Is it also what we eat maybe? And what about sleep, stress, digestion, movement throughout the day, all of these lifestyle habits and supplements And one thing we often forget about, gratitude, play, and laughter. We can be so driven and ambitious and over-performers that we forget to stop and smell the roses. Sometimes we just need to push pause, reset, reboot the system, and look at what are you doing now, and is it helping you get results A lot of people are doing a lot of fasted exercise, doing a long intermittent fast or longer 24-hour, 72-hour fast and exercising a lot and doing lots of biohacking as hot and cold therapy or cold plunge every morning and sauna every night. What about you? Are these new nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle habits helping you feel better, look better, move better. My goal is to get stronger, get good body composition, leaner, get faster and more powerful as I age and I'm into my second half of my life. Now, maybe you're not my age, but maybe you're 40. You need to start looking at how do you want to be living life and showing up every day when you are 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. If you follow Peter Atiyah, 
this is pretty much what his book is about and what his platform is. He is an ex endurance cyclist, endurance swimmer, bodybuilder, hardcore everything. He tends to do everything to the extreme. And even Peter Atia has stopped, push pause and go, okay, am I able to play with my kids when I'm older? Am I going to be strong enough to pick up my kids and lift them up? Am I able to go swimming and get myself out of the pool by just lifting myself up out of the ledge of the pool? All these things are what I've been thinking about a lot since my dad passed away a year and a half ago and watching my mom age and my husband's father age and he lost his mother already to Parkinson's. Then last week we were on a Holland America cruise ship for a week with his dad, who's 90 and his girlfriend, who's 88. And most of the people on the ship were that age range, a lot older than I was. I I felt young, like a kid. (laughs) I felt actually, uh, yeah, I was very youthful and active feeling compared to watching these people that had poor mobility. They were very overweight, a lot of them, or they're walking around with a walker or cane or their oxygen tank. There are lots of wheelchairs zooming around. But is this a choice? If you're fit and active now, as an aging athlete, are you doing everything you can do to live your best life as you get older? So when we are starting to design our future self right out, what you want in your journal tonight, what do you want to do when you're 80 or 90 years old? I want to be one of these people on the cruise ships, but going on the little tender boat to shore each day and doing an excursion, experiencing life, traveling the world that requires muscle health. So my focus today is my rabbit hole of metabolism as I do Pinoy metabolic testing and find a lot of people have really lower than optimal metabolism for their age, gender, height, and weight. And how do you improve your metabolism? That would be with strength, resistance training, and prioritizing protein in our meals. I just had my main meal at three o'clock today, work day, I don't eat after 5 PM, usually, unless I do an extra, a workout that I didn't get in, but I go to bed at eight o'clock. So I stop eating three hours before bed. I wake up four 45 in the morning before five. So I stop eating earlier than a normal person. I know I go to bed way earlier than a normal person. I'm not normal. I know. So I prioritize protein. My meal was steak butter, and sea salt. I'm not a carnivore. I'm listening to my body when I feel like eating. I did have half an apple with some sunflower butter and more Redmond sea salt because my body just needs more salt. It craves it. Now, oh, and I had a piece of dark chocolate macadamia nut together with that. That was really, really, really good. So going back to the focus, two types of muscle metabolism. As an athlete, you probably know there's aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism. Now, aerobic, you've probably learned in school, is metabolism in the presence of oxygen. This is a primary pathway involved in oxidative phosphorylation, which takes place in the mitochondria of our muscle cells. During aerobic metabolism, Glucose and fatty acids are broken down through a series of chemical reactions to produce ATP, which you know is the energy currency of cells. This process is more efficient in terms of ATP production and is a predominant method for providing energy during sustained low to moderate intensity activities as endurance exercises or what we call when we do your metabolic testing zone one and zone two. Then we get into zone three to zone four and to zone five. And we see as the breathing rate changes, we measure your breathing frequencies. And when I do Pinoy metabolic testing, we see the fuel source, carbohydrate to fat source change and 
your source for fuel will change at higher intensities to lactate and creatine phosphate. But going into anaerobic metabolism, anaerobic absence of oxygen and when oxygen supply is insufficient to meet the energy demands of the muscle. So we can do this when I'm doing your metabolic assessment at rest, you lay there and we're measuring what happens with your metabolism while resting, measuring your breathing frequencies and measuring your fat to carbohydrate ratio based on a respiratory exchange ratio. When you are doing, doing the exercise test, I'm increasing the intensity based on your current fitness level. And we do a little warm up test with RPE before we do the actual test that I create a protocol based on your fitness level. And we find where are your zones where you're aerobic to anaerobic. So when we get into more, probably your zone three, we shift from fat fuel to more carbohydrate fuel, and we'll see the breathing rate change per minute. The primary pathways involved in your anaerobic metabolism that we see shifting into glycolysis and lactate, lactic acid fermentation. During your anaerobic metabolism, glucose is partially broken down to produce ATP quickly. This is less efficient than aerobic metabolism. We are needing more. So we'll get back to those zones. If you're doing a long workout, you want to be in aerobic metabolism where you're burning mostly fat and some carbohydrates are used. You're not 100% fat usually. There's always some carbs being burned. And we can measure how much that is when we do your test and how many calories you're burning. But when we get to zone three, changes. Zone four changes again, and zone four goes to zone five. And then we hit your max. Now, anaerobic metabolism is used during short bursts of high intensity activities, even weight lifting and sprinting. We talk about zone five in your sprint training. So what fuel source you are burning, are you aerobic or anaerobic? We can measure that oxygen to carbon dioxide. The ratio of the two can tell us your fat to carbohydrate usage. And we see that metabolic crossover point in your metabolism test, your VO2 max test. We can see where fat drops off and carbohydrate usage goes up. And then we can see the breathing rate change and we can see where there's more lactate and also creatine phosphate is probably the energy system as you get higher. And then into zone five, it is being used because you are quickly needing energy. So other factors that impact your muscle metabolism, of course, are nutrition, training status, looking at heart rate variability, I'd like to look at, and overall health. So how is this related to mitochondria, to cellular health, to the biochemical processes that happens in the muscle cells? We want to improve the aging process and we want to avoid losing muscle as we get older. And you can see this happening as I do in my own parents or my mother. Now my dad hurt his back. I look back, it was April and he couldn't move. He was stuck on his back and no one could help him. We couldn't get him to a chiropractor. The doctors, we got him into the hospital. They didn't know anything. They're really not any help. And then being bedridden and sleeping on a chair, not being able to walk. Think of what happens within a week of being bedridden. Take that a few weeks. And then he had to go to the hospital because he had kidney issues, wasn't peeing. And then downhill spiral, two weeks in the hospital being bedridden and he passed away. So muscle health is so important. Movement, cellular level, we want to work on improving how we are aging. So energy production, we went over muscle cells require a constant supply of energy to perform various functions, contractions of the muscle cellular structure maintenance and making those new cells. So we have what we know about ATP creating energy. We know about nutrient utilization. Muscle metabolism involves breakdown as glucose and fatty acids to generate energy as we talked about glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation for fat fuel to break that down. Proper nutrient utilization supports making 
new cells using proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, which are essential for cell structure, repair, and function. So we want to eat the right type of foods as essential fatty acids to make those cell membranes. We want to get the proteins broken down properly for those building blocks of our body, essential fatty acids, I mean, essential amino acids. So we need these building blocks and we need the fats that make up our cells and do so many things for our body. And then the carbohydrates, yes, they're not essential, but they are used for fuel when you are anaerobic. So you could break down protein gluconeogenesis to make glucose. But if you are lean and healthy, my argument is, and I'm not a high carb person and I'm, I'm trying to experiment with adding some more fruit, but what we want to look at, if you're trying to do a hard, intense, high output workout, like a sprint interval training, going all out to zone five, coming down to zone one, you are needing some glucose, but I don't want to lose muscle to create fuel. So sometimes we can add in maybe a little fuel from S fuels, the race plus, or trying a Vespa or having some fruit for some people. It works for Brad Kearns. I can't tolerate that much fructose, so it depends on the person. So we can go in the different rabbit holes of muscle, metabolism, and cellular health, your oxygen supply, your waste removal, cellular signaling, and adaptation and resiliency. But I won't bore you with all that. You can read my blog. My rabbit holes are on debbiepotts.net under my blog. So you may want to know, okay, how do I burn more fat? How does fat metabolism work? What can I do to lose fat and get better body composition? Gaining muscle and losing fat is a common goal. So we want to look at why is zone two so popular? We need to also look at why are men different than women when the recommendations are hot in social media and from top podcasters say VO2 max is a sign of longevity along with grip strength. And then looking at improving VO2 max is zone two. But do we want to look at other benefits of sprint training, zone four, and looking at other ways we can improve our body composition. So it's not just zone two. And Stacey Sims, Dr. Sims would argue that women from birth are already better at zone two. So if you are peri post menopause, you might need just one workout a week of zone two to burn more fat and be more fat adapted by how you eat. But men may need a little more than that. Women, as we age, as my goal is to get faster, get leaner, stronger, more powerful. I don't need a lot of zone two at this stage of my life. I've done zone two training for 25 years as an endurance athlete. I started doing long distance cycling and endurance events, Ironmans, marathons when I was in my 20, late twenties. So at 51, hold on my, I'm 52 now, uh, 50 something years old, I need to change how I fuel and how I train to get my goals and not do it just on what everyone says to get more fat loss, to spend more time in zone two. Now, if you do a metabolic test, I can identify where you need more work on based on what you have been doing and what we see in your test. So we can see if I look at a Pinoy article, I can put this in the show notes, exercise intensity zones and metabolic response. Zone two, you may be burning 4.5 calories a minute with a fuel mixture of 75% fat and 25% carbohydrates. These markers will change over time as you move into a higher level of exercise and intensity, different intensity zones because you require more energy. You're working harder. You're going to burn more calories. But the fuel mixture will change. So the fuel mixture mixture required to sustain that growing level of energy release needs to change. So we want to look at how we generate energy in the body. 
So during exercise, your body burns a mixture of fats and carbohydrates to release energy required. So calories, we burn calories to move. This process uses oxygen, as we talked about aerobic metabolism, oxygen, and this is referred to oxidation of fats and carbohydrates. Fat releases more energy than carbohydrates when burned. Fat, we burn nine calories per gram of fat versus four calories a gram of carbohydrates. But as a slower burning process makes it suitable for low exercise intensities where the rate of energy demand is low. Carbohydrates require less time to burn and can therefore support higher exercise intensities where the rate of energy demand is larger. As a result, this is from Pinoe.com blog on performance. As a result, the fuel mixture changes predominantly fats when exercise intensities and energy requirements are low to carbohydrate dominant as exercise intensity increases and the rate with the body needs to release energy increases. So as the demand of energy increases, cells need to depend more on carbohydrates since they release energy faster, right? Makes sense. On the other hand, cells rely on fat as a fuel source despite its slow energy release process for as long as energy demands are low. So if we look at the chart in this blog, you can see what I see when I'm doing metabolic testing. As I increase your resistance or your on the bike or the speed on the treadmill, every minute it will go up. Your oxygen demand will go up. The speed increases. You'll see the fuel source change. So we identify where you are burning the most fat and the lowest amount of carbohydrates. That is your zone two. Where the top of your zone two is where that metabolic crossover point begins. Where do you start to shift from depending on fat to now you're depending on primarily carbohydrates, a fuel source. That marker will help us identify your zone two training. It also tells me if you've been doing any zone two training, is your fat burning happening? Your zone two is happening early on and you shift to that carbohydrate burn rate a little bit earlier than you should. Then on the flip side, I can see the intensity changing and how well do you perform in the higher heart rate zones? Do you fatigue very quickly and you start to have to stop the test early on because your legs are burning in the bike test or perhaps you find yourself not comfortable breathing at such a, being such a high heart rate. That happens. Plus you're breathing in a mask. It's uncomfortable. So we sometimes estimate what you might be able to go a little bit longer, but the max heart rate we identify if the test goes well and your VO2 max. So we can see the intensity zones changing with the heart rate zones. The exercise intensity zones are defined based on your body's metabolic response when exercising at a specific intensity. The metabolic response is defined by the calories expended and the contribution of fats and carbohydrates in the calorie burning process at that particular intensity. So to measure how many calories you're burning along with how much fat and carbohydrates you're burning, we need to analyze your data of how much oxygen you're expiring in carbon dioxide using our metabolic analyzer. Analyzer, sorry. So since the metabolic testing can only be done in a test setup, I can't do this remote. You have to come see me in Del Mar, Solana Beach, North San Diego, California. Or I will be going to Kona again, hopefully, and doing more testing there in a few months. So we need to have baseline data and we need to stop guessing what those zones are for you because I've tested a lot of people recently and I find a lot of people are not really in zone two. They're zone twos or zone three or people that think they're doing interval work, but they're really just staying in zone four. 
the entire workout. Intervals, as you've heard me say many times, are going up to zone five, down to zone one. Go back up, go back down. Or zone four, zone one. Or zone three, zone one. So those zones will change over time if you follow our suggestions for training and nutrition and your lifestyle habits. So I know a lot of people are a little ambitious, overachievers. They're doing a little bit too much of everything. You hear something's good, you do it every day. Cold plunge, amazing, every day. Women, we already have a lot of stress, so we might need less hormetic stressors and make sure we do more yoga stretching and yin yoga and more nature walks. And then when we're ready to go hard, we're doing more short burst sprint training that doesn't raise cortisol because it's just acute stress of 30 to 45 seconds max. We're not doing the minute or longer intervals if you are around my time in life. So we need a personalized program. This one size fits all that everyone should do this. Everyone should eat this. Everyone should take these supplements does not work. We need to look at what's going on. So we want to look at testing every three months for sure every six months if you're in maintenance, but if you want to get improvements for body composition changes, for performance gains, or just you want to be healthy and work on your longevity, your aging process. So training in zones, they're going to be more specific to what we test you on the treadmill or the bike, figure out how many calories, fats, and carbohydrates you burn, how much you're burning throughout the day, your metabolic response and your heart rate. That's going to be based on what you're doing now. So if you are burning 30% fat during exercise, 70% carbs at 140 heart rate when you're running, but then you're only burning 15% fat, 85% carbs at 140 heart rate when cycling, your body might be feeling more leg fatigue, burning sensation in your legs when you're biking relatively lower heart rate range because it's different for cycling versus running. And it depends on how much you're training in on your bike or running. And if you're a triathlete, you might spend equal time or you might do more running because you like it more. It's for me, it's winter time. I'm not biking it nearly as much as we do in the summertime and the fall. So it's going to be not exactly the same. So your heart rate ranges in your zone two on the treadmill or, or running outside is going to be different than your bike heart rate. So we want to test your and measure your cellular fitness, your heart fitness, heart rate variability, low frequency, high frequency, your lung capacity, your VO2 max and more. And looking at how much time you should spend in each zone is really important. And this is where we need to individualize it because it depends on you what you have been doing, where are your areas of opportunity, what are you not doing well based on the test results, and what are your goals coming up in the near future and your future self. So following a training program with more accurate training zones is really helpful to change your body composition, to improve your muscle health, because we need to know what's going on under the hood. What are you doing now to get to your goals? If you're trying to improve muscle health, trying to improve your metabolism, you're working on being more metabolically healthy, we need to do a blood chemistry analysis, ideally some food sensitivity test, leaky gut test, a gut stool test, and figure out more what's going on if you want to be your best self. So sticking with testing and the fitness test, the five zones that we use, and we capture the data, figure out the different metabolic states to figure out where, what heart rate is your zone. So there's different metabolic adaptations in each zone. So zone one, we've discussed before training intensity, typical warm up, or this is your recovery. So when you're doing the sprints, zone five or four, three, you come down to zone one. If you're doing zone two, that's where you're developing your mitochondria function and improve your fat burning efficiency. This is recommended for your endurance sports and suffering from type two diabetes, even metabolic health that you need to get more, more metabolically efficient at burning fat as your main fuel source. You're improving your mitochondria function, support recovery capacity, helps you recover faster after intense exercise. So mitochondria function is a key part of zone two. Zone three will help you strengthen your pulmonary muscles and cardiovascular function. 
This is an ideal intensity when suffering from a lung or heart problem since this moderate intensity is a solid stimulus for the heart and the lungs without being exhausting or overly strenuous. Now zone four, this is where we can help improve your VO2 max and zone five will help VO2 max. So that's where I hear VO2 max is a sign of longevity and that's why you want to do zone two and then sprint interval training zone four and five. But again, people don't do them right. If you're not coming down to zone one before you go back up, you're really not doing your sprint interval training. So we want to check that out. Now you want to look at, whoops, sorry, the sprints. If you're doing zone three, they are 10 to 20 minute duration. And then as I've gone over this before, your recovery would be half that time. So if you're doing 10 to 20 minute piece in zone three, you do that one time, 10 minutes say, and then I'm recovering zone one for four minutes. Repeat 10 minute piece up to 20 minutes, come back four minutes. If I'm doing 10, if I'm doing 20 minutes, it's eight minutes. If I'm doing a longer piece, top of zone three, bottom of zone four, that'd be five minute piece or 10 minute piece. The recovery after that five minutes is two and a half minutes, easy zone one. 10 minutes, I'd come back, do five minutes, easy zone one. That is interval training. Now, if I'm doing more HIIT training, if I'm going to do, let's see, well, this chart says uh, zone four would be 30, I would say 30 to 60 seconds, but say you're doing 30 to 60 seconds, your recovery is down to zone one for that same amount of time. It's a one-to-one work-to-rest ratio. But then, this is where people are not doing their sprint interval training. I'll go back to those benefits. 10 to 30 seconds all out is zone five training. 10 to 30 seconds. Then, you come down to zone one for twice that length of time. The work to rest ratio of sprint interval training is a one to two ratio. That means 10 to 30 seconds sprint, 20 to 60 seconds rest in zone one. Zone one's all the way back down, say to 100, 120 heart rate, depending on your test. We identify that in your zones in your metabolic test. So intervals, tempo, long interval, medium interval, short interval training, they all are a certain amount of time of effort. And then recovery duration will be different. So tempo would be a 2.5 work to one ratio rest. A long interval is two to one work to rest. A medium interval, 10 to 30 seconds, Let's say 30, I think that says 30 to 60. Oh, it says 30 to 90. I can't read. Work to rest. And then a sprint interval is 10 to 30. So zone five, 10 to 30 seconds. Zone four, we're doing 30 to 90 seconds. Zone top of zone three to bottom of zone four, we're five to 10 minutes. Zone three, more of my half marathon pace, 10 to 20 minute pieces. Okay. So it's really important if you want results, you're not getting anywhere by just doing zone four for an entire 30, 45 minute run, you might not be getting the benefits. So remember zone three was strengthening your pulmonary muscles and cardiovascular function. Zone four is the VO2 max and your ability to sustain high intensity exercise for prolonged duration by improving lactate shuttling. Lactate is not a bad thing. Lactic acid, we used to always think, oh, it's so bad, a lactic acid burn. Actually, lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. We can use it. We use it as fuel for muscles and get recycled back and we can use it. For as long as your body can clear fatigue byproducts, this is super important. We use lactate as a byproduct Lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. It can also be used as fuel for muscles. As long as your body can clear fatigue byproducts faster than they're being produced, the exercise intensity remains sustainable. 
So the greater your lactate shedling capability, the greater your ability to sustain high exercise intensities for long periods of time. How do you do that? Go back to that chart in my blog, the benefits of each zone. That would be zone top of three to bottom of four. I'm doing that five to 10 minute piece or medium long intervals of 30 to 90 seconds, one to one ratio, come back down 30 to 90 seconds. That is the secret sauce. Women, Stacy Sims says more of us, peri and postmenopause, sprint interval training. Don't be stuck training in your zone three and zone four, bottom of zone four, and just staying there. It's zone two or intervals. Zone five down to zone one or zone four to one, back and forth, back and forth. So if you are training that way, as everyone I keep testing is training the wrong way based on research. The benefits of zone four, we just said, improves your VO2 max, but you only get those improvements if you train four to zone one. You want to improve your ability to clear the fatigue byproducts faster than they are being produced. You only do that my intuition says this, but I guarantee you, you only do that by going into zone one before you go back. So try it. You may be getting stronger and faster if you add more of these sprint interval trainings. Okay, zone five will also improve your VO2 max and your peak power output capability. This is your maximum speed or cycling watts. So on your bike, you can do these sprints. I was trying to do them running on a hill, but that's more for strength than getting my heart rate up, but I can improve my power on a bike doing hill repeats. This exercise intensity is sustainable, which I don't agree. This is 60 to 120 seconds. Zone five is 10 to 30 seconds. Zone four, we're gonna say 30 to 90 seconds. So I think that's wrong. But that's what the article says. We want to remember the benefits of each training zone and figure out how much time you, as a unique individual, needs to spend in each zone. So regardless of age, gender, and fitness level, your goals, every person has one or more systems that limit their fitness or their health. So targeting these limitations, I like to call them their areas of opportunity. My client Clayton taught me that years ago. Areas of opportunity. Where are you not being your optimal self? Because you're probably not training that way. So we can identify which areas you're missing. What are you doing too much of and not enough of? So we need to focus on cardio interval training. What zones will help you get the right adaptations to overcome those areas of opportunity. So a metabolic analysis done the right way, not just a test, but how someone reads your results after the test and how to put that together with your intake forms, your history, and ideally your blood chemistry test, a body composition test, and if you can do some other functional labs to get the whole picture and how you can have a nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle program that's more what I call the holistic method. So a metabolic analysis is the gold standard accuracy in determining your training zones and helps us create a personalized plan that's going to be more effective and productive instead of wasting time guessing how you should train because this is what you heard on somebody's podcast, except mine, (laughs) because I'm telling you to get a personalized program. So save some money, get a test, come out to San Diego, I do charge $397 for my exercise and resting metabolism test, but that also includes a follow-up coaching call and all my work and assessment. So it's actually half the price what it should be for all the work I put into my assessments. But the test itself takes an hour and a half to do both, and it really helps you get results. Now, I would say looking at nutrition and diving in next time to muscle protein synthesis because metabolism, improving your VO2 max, 
figuring out what zones to train in, where you're burning the most fat, where your carbohydrate point is, where you start to burn more lactate for fuel, creatine phosphate, we can help with the breathing rate. But you still need to work on nutrition. And most people are eating the wrong foods. I'm not, as I said, carnivore, I'm not keto, I'm just eat real food that's nutrient dense that you want to be more building muscle. So right now I'm focusing on eating protein. And as I started to say, but I don't even think I said it, I had a bowl of cut up steak with butter and sea salt. Maybe I did say that. Oh yeah, I did an apple. Now yesterday I had a burger and uh, often pickles. And then this morning I did have hard boiled egg, two hard boiled eggs with some turkey sausage that I found at Sprouts in the freezer section. Good new find. I should share on my Instagram. But I'm eating. Yes, I'm, I sound like I'm carnivore, but I'm not strict. I'm just doing what I feel like. And I am doing more protein. When I was in Hawaii for two weeks, I had papaya and pineapple every day because it's amazing. And I got it from the fruit stand and off, pretty much off the tree. And macadamia nuts and avocado because it was fresh and local. So I eat fruit and I'll eat vegetables like a seafood cob salad with crab and shrimp and hard boiled eggs. That's another favorite. So we want to work on nutrition, not just your exercise because it doesn't work. If you're just focusing on exercise, you need to work on nutrition. And even if you're nutrition, you need to work on stress management because if you listen to me for 10 years, chronic stress impacts everything. So all this goes out the door if you're stressed out and sympathetic dominant. So when I'm working with clients, I meet them where they're at and I need to figure out where we need to start. Where's our priority? Because there's a lot to work on. So starting simple, as we talk about making hitting base hits, Dr. Tom O'Brien says in his books, hit base hits to get a home run. Don't try to do everything at once. It's overwhelming. So maybe you start with exercise Maybe you start with your strength training, figure out where to add in sprint training when you're ready, if you have a base, and then prioritizing protein in your meals. Maybe you need to start with that. But then often we need digestive enzymes or take some HCL betaine before we eat or some apple cider vinegar and some lemon water. It is what we eat, but properly digesting and breaking down that protein is another challenge for most of us. And having a good microbiome you know, all this is connected. So if you are not getting the results you want, you might need to get an evaluation. Muscle protein synthesis, by the way, is a process by which the body builds new protein molecules to repair and grow muscle tissue. It involves the synthesis of proteins from amino acids. These are the building blocks of proteins. So talking about exercise and muscle development, we need muscle protein synthesis to repair the damage caused by the cause to the muscle fibers during physical activity and promote muscle growth. So as we are fit and active aging athletes, or doing a lot of training, we need to make sure we are matching that endurance exercise. That's catabolic breaking us down with anabolic building muscle building exercises in the gym, strength training and the nutrient dense foods to help muscle protein synthesis, which is getting enough of the right essential amino acids with leucine, which is really almost nearly impossible to get the right amount through a plant-based diet. I researched that in another blog because you'll overeat calories before you hit those protein goals. So you'll get too many calories in to trying to get 40, 50 grams of protein with three grams of leucine in there. So Going into leucine, that you need that to trigger muscle protein synthesis. It's a Dr. Donald Lehman's research on the threshold to really create muscle protein synthesis to activate mTOR, which is not a bad thing. We need mTOR and AMPK pathway, but you need to get the right quality protein with the right amino acid pro- amino acid profile with the right amount of leucine in those amino acids. So foods higher leucine are animal based proteins is meat, poultry, fish, and dairy to help promote muscle protein synthesis and timing protein rich meals around exercise resistance training can affect and enhance effectiveness of leucine threshold and promoting muscle protein synthesis. So we want to look at meal timing in and around workouts different for men than women, 
but figuring out how to get some grass-fed red meat as beef, steak, ground beef, getting around two grams of leucine per 100 grams of beef. Pork, if you do pork, it's 1.8 grams of leucine per 100 grams of pork. Fish, salmon or tuna, leucine content vary, but 2.5 to 2.8 grams of leucine in 100 grams. So it's getting the full not just taking leucine, it doesn't work. You have to get the full essential amino acid profile, but that has to have a certain amount of leucine in all the essential amino acid profile together to get the muscle protein synthesis. So that was my other rabbit hole. But we need to make sure we're building muscle and we're not fighting as we age and as endurance athletes, the breaking down the muscles. Remember cortisol, chronic stress, you will be in a catabolic state. If you are over training aerobic exercise over 45 minutes can raise cortisol. You can be in a catabolic state. So we need to make sure you are fit and not fat, but fit and healthy and strong, good body composition, lean body mass. You need to increase by cutting back on your endurance exercise, doing more strength training, and maybe just doing a long distance workout on the weekend and short stuff with sprints in the middle of the workout and some more time lifting weights. So meal timing, eating healthy fats, getting your protein quality, rich foods, getting proper sleep, hydration with electrolytes as element and managing your stress with meditation, gratitude journal, deep breathing exercises, sauna. As we say, chronic stress can contribute to that catabolic process and hinder muscle growth. If you're not getting enough sleep, the body goes under repair and growth while you're sleeping. So that will impact your ability to have a healthier body and body composition. Optimizing your hormones is essential, but that's how we want to change how we train for Dr. Stacy Sims recommendations. So if your metabolism is slowing down as you age, finish this up, loss of muscle mass, change in hormone levels. We get a lower basal metabolic rate. We have a decline in physical activity. We have a decrease in thermic effect of food, TEF. We have changes in our body composition. Genetic factors make a difference. Nutrient intake and diet. So these are all markers of why we get slower metabolism, but how much of that can we control? Muscle mass, hormones, metabolism. We just talked about how to increase it with exercise, strength training, protein, increase your activity level, increase your movement throughout the day. Changes in your body composition is by strength training and eating more protein. Genetics are where they are, but epigenetics, your lifestyle factors, how you're living your life and showing up every day, your positive mindset. And of course, nutrient intake and diet is a choice. So all these markers that influence metabolism, you can't change your genetics, but epigenetics you can control. So you want to make sure you're not fasting too much, not exercising too much chronic cardio and making sure you're working on the right type of training, right type of heart zones, right type of strength training, getting your blood chemistry panel with insulin on it, a full thyroid panel. You need to get, look at your testosterone levels, get a Dutch test and see what your cortisol rhythms during the day. I mean, there's a lot to it. So Get a little savings account for your health savings bank account because you're just putting that into your longevity bank account. So hopefully my rabbit holes help give you some ideas where you might need to start and work on so you can live your best life and be your best self. So that was all for today. Let me know your thoughts, questions, and comments, and where do you want me to go to next? Hey, my fellow aging endurance athletes, just a reminder, if you like what you listen to today, make sure to share this episode with your community. Head to debbiepotts.net to set up a free discovery call to learn more about my personalized coaching programs, especially if you are on a mission as myself to improve the aging process and start training to be my best self when I am 80, 90 years old. So I am on a mission to live my best life and be my best self the second half of my life. So if you're on the same mission as me, 
head over to my website and YouTube channel to learn more ways to improve the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at debbiepotts.net. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.